All right, we're going to start with some very quick door prize drawings and then go on with our speakers. And we will do the remainder of the door prize drawings and the drawing for the quilt and uh, some other prizes at the end. Uh, if you are interested, we will give you a notice ahead of time. Uh, we'll give you a five minute notice to go put your name down on a bid uh, just before we uh, go ahead and draw and announce, not in that case, uh, announce the winners of the bids on the art. So I have some runners here that are gonna help. Before I do this, I wanna tell you I forgot to announce this. Each of, you, each of you have a package of Alaskan note cards that are yours, that were underneath your program. So please don't forget to take those home. You've already won one door prize right there. All right, the next one is some playing cards, Alaska playing cards and a magnet. And the winner is, I'll do the last three numbers. Three, two, eight. Just raise your hand. Three, two, eight. Oh, way in the back. Okay, thank you. Oh, I heard it got some. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're just going to do a couple? Yes. Okay. All right, next. This is a longtime Anchorage uh, eating establishment. Lucky Wishbone. And we have the next two will be Lucky Wishbones coupons. You get two coupons, uh, each valued at $9.75. So that's $19.50 right here. You can take someone to lunch. All right. The first one goes to $3.45. Hey! The next one goes to 384. Where's 384? Oh. <laughs> we have two quick ones. Another establishment that's been here a long time is Arctic Roadrunners, and they are very good to seniors. They have a special uh, senior day, and they gave us a number of coupons, the first recipient, and the second will get two coupons, uh, 920 value, so that's 1840, so you get to take somebody else to lunch. The first one is 433, 433. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> well, somebody else gets to take someone special to lunch. 3.30. 3.30. And the last one we're going to do at this time so we can listen to two more wonderful speakers. We have a collector's item. It's a 1986 rendezvous plate. And Nathaniel's gonna bring that too. Gotta mix these up, right? No, Pete doesn't have two tickets. <laughs> and I didn't take one. <laughs> so this one goes to 423. 423, oh, I see a hand back there. Thank you, and I'll be back after our last speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. And really, lunch is the least that, that Pete and Judy deserve for this incredible night. Thank you so much. Our third speaker is John Speaker. John was living on his family farm in Virginia, and one day he and his identical twin brother Rudy were looking at a map of Alaska and decided to take a trip. They then planned a trip that would take them from Kotzebue to the Canadian border along the backbone of the Brooks Range, a distance of a thousand miles. 
These twin brothers had cut their teeth with hikes on the Appalachian Trail, and they had also hiked the entire Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada. But nothing on those hikes had prepared them for the power of Alaska's wilderness. They arrived in Kotzebue in the spring of 1975, unprepared without snowshoes or skis like true chichacos. They began walking into the Alaska wild, a journey that would soon test their very will to live. That hike is what John is going to tell us about tonight. But before we hear about that harrowing traveling, let me tell you a little bit more about John. In the winter of 1978, he skied so low 800 miles from Ruby to Point Hope. After that ski trip, he became a commercial fisherman for five years, mostly in Homer and Bristol Bay. And since fishing, John has worked as a salesman, freelance photographer, and a people mover driver. He retired in 2014. Please help me welcome John. If you were lost in a wilderness and the odds seemed impossible, could you make it out? No. no. Could you summon something deep within you to keep moving even though you were starving and you were watching your body cannibalize itself? I had never considered this question until the spring of 1975 when my identical twin brother Rudy and I became lost in the Brooks Range. From our home in Virginia, we had looked at the map of Alaska and we had decided that we would begin at Kotzebue on the very northwest part of Alaska on the Arctic Ocean and we would hike or ski all the way to Old Crow, Canada. There were some villages along the way, there would be no attack, and a Tuvik Pass, an Arctic village. It would be about 70 miles from Kotzebue to no attack. We figured that would be a good warm up. And then 300 miles from no attack to Anak Tuvik Pass. And then about 200 miles on to Arctic Village. And then another 200 to Old Crow. Now, we would had a lot of experience in long distance hiking and some mountaineering. So we looked at this map and like true Chichacos, we said, well, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> we didn't know what the snow conditions would be when we came up in the spring. So I called a federal office in Fairbanks and a young man answered the phone and I says, we're coming up in the spring, should we bring snowshoes and skis? He said, no, leave him home. He said, the Arctic is like a desert. You'll be lucky to have two inches of snow. Well, when we arrived in Kotzebue and we saw three feet of snow, I knew I had talked to the wrong man. <laughs> now, the trip, to, the trip from Kotzebue to no attack was really easy. It was a hard packed snow machine trail. We just walked on the trail. There was a, it was well marked. A lot of people would come by. And many of them suggested that we shoot the ptarmigan. We were carrying a, a shotgun and a 22. And so we shot a few ptarmigan. And then we got to no attack and we found it to be a, a delightfully friendly village. The, the manager of the trading post Floyd Wesley was very concerned about us. And he would say, well, let's look at the maps again. And we would draw out the maps. And, and he would look at them, and he would say, now this would be the best way. And he says, now if you get lost, go to the Kobuk River. He says, there's lots of boats and planes there. You'll get rescued. Well, after we left no attack, we entered just untracked, beautiful wilderness. We were just enthralled with the beauty. And for the first couple of days, it was really easy walking. There had been some freeze and thaw, and the crust had frozen, so we could easily walk on it. And then it began to get warmer. We were getting into the second week of May. 
and we were getting into just the precursor of breakup. And the, the nights were really long, but the days were, I mean, the nights were twilight, but the afternoons would get hot. And when they got hot, the crust would melt and we would sink up to our waist in the snow. And so we began to walk in the twilight of night and, and also in the early morning, and we would walk on the crust of the snow. One day we were out and we were just beginning to walk, fall through the crust when we spotted a grizzly bear track. And he seemed to know exactly the way to find the hardest snow. And so we followed his tracks, hoping all along that we wouldn't catch him snoozing up ahead. But it began to really warm up, and the creeks, the rivers began to thaw. One, one time we crossed a river that was about, about 10 inches of, of water over the ice, and we just walked real gingerly, testing every step, but we made it across. There were some rivers that weren't in overflow, but the ice was thin, and so we got down on our bellies, we crawled across, we, we, we put our, our ropes on them, our, our backpacks on a rope, and we pulled them across with us. And then one afternoon, after almost two weeks, the snow was really soft, and we, we were plunging up to our waist all afternoon. And so we decided to camp and to wait for night when the temperature would lower. Well, we were just waking up, and a snowstorm was blowing in, and the temperature was dropping. And we were concerned, because the snowstorm carried, had a lot of clouds with it, and it, it lowered and obscured the peaks. And we were concerned that if we walked, we would get lost. But we were behind schedule. All, at, all the while, all, we had not gone nearly as, as far as we had hoped to. So we walked. We walked on a hard crust, and all night long, we tried to get the map to reconcile with the terrain, but it was impossible to be sure, because we would look at the map, and there were the squiggles on the map. We never knew if that was really that mountain, because it was covered with a cloud. It seemed like all night that the map was about halfway right, but by morning, we stopped and we built a campfire, and we knew we were lost. It was very sobering to be out there lost in this wilderness, and we, were, we felt some apprehension. We also wondered, why didn't we heed the pilot in Kotzebue who told us, you really should get an emergency locator transmitter in case you get lost <laughs> or have trouble. But we had said, no way. That would just take the adventure out of the trip. <laughs> For five days, we continued on, always hoping to try to get, always trying to get back on the map. But we never could be sure. Things would be a sort of about halfway right. And sometimes we walked at night when the, when the, um, when the crust would harden up, as we went through some really snow-covered passes. One night we looked out over and all we could see ahead of us was snow-covered mountains and snow. It just looked like it was, it was just formidable, the trail ahead. But for three days we kept walking in the twilight at night and we got through it. And then we entered into open tundra where the snow had melted and we walked with tussocks that came up to our knees in saturated tundra. It was there we saw a grizzly bear from a distance. He was about a thousand feet off. And when he saw us, he stood up on his hind legs and he just came down and he came running as hard as he could. We were scrambled up on this huge boulder and we just watched him run towards us. We had only a 20 gauge shotgun and a 22, and we didn't think we could do much damage. Luckily for us, he got within about 200 feet of us, just stopped, and turned and ran. 
We saw a couple, we saw some caribou from a distance, and we were able to shoot a few ptarmigan. And then on the fifth day after being lost, we walked up on this ridge, and we looked out over the Kobuk Basin. And there, nearly as far as the eye could see, we could see a glimmer of light reflecting off, it was the, off the Kobuk River. Well, we remembered what Floyd had told us. If you get lost, go to the Kobuk River. And we reasoned that would probably be a good idea. <laughs> we were low on food at this point, and we thought, getting the Anactuvik Pass is probably not going to happen. So we figured we would go down to the Kobuk, resupply, and come back into the mountains. And like true Chichacos, we underestimated everything. We thought it would take us four days. It would end up taking us at least nine. We got down. But we began to go down, and the snow was deep, and it covered the bushes. And our legs be would plunge through and become entangled in the bushes. But the, there was crust that was just hard enough to carry our bodies. So all day, we swam over that snow. You can literally crawl over the crust when it's thin. And we pulled our backpacks with a rope. We camped that night, and the next day, we had walls of willows to get through. The willows were so thick, it was, they were almost impenetrable. We, it was literally like threading a needle. Finally, we found a little creek that ran through the willows, and we got in the creek and just walked on it. Our feet became frozen. We would stop and thaw them out. We could just hit them, and it felt like a block of ice. Finally, late that day, we got down to the basin, and there was a river there, and the river was about 75 feet. So we decided, well, we'll just build us a raft and float down to the Kobuk River. Why, this should be easy. <laughs> well, we worked for hours building that raft. We pulled logs off the hillside, and we built a campfire, and we squared up the logs with over the campfire. And in a side eddy of the river, we put them together. We lashed them together with some nylon rope. And while we were doing that, a seagull flew overhead. And my brother says, I think we should eat that. And so he shot it out of the sky. <laughs> and we ran out, and we grasped each other by arms, and we got that seagull in a death grip. Now, since everybody has just finished a nice meal, I won't go into the details of seagull meat. Okay. We finished a raft, and we put everything on, and we jumped on. And guess what? It actually floated. We were amazed. But the river was only about 75 feet, but pretty soon it started to widen. There were all these little rivers coming in. Pretty soon it was about 300 feet and just roaring. And our raft just started cavorting, back, round and round. It was impossible to control it. And at one point we went through this rapids that were about three feet high. And the raft, inst instead of going with the flow, it just went straight through them. And we were standing up to over our knees in water. And then there were sweepers, these low-hanging limbs. And we would get down low on the raft so they wouldn't knock us off. And then there was a sweeper. And it hit the front of the raft. And we were going so fast, it literally just catapulted us off the raft. We managed to scramble back underneath the raft and, and get some of our gear. But we lost a lot of food. We scrambled up on the bank, and we took a, an inventory of where we were. We still had dry matches, so we made a fire. But our ammunition had gotten wet. We had, a, we had all the ammunition in a plastic bottle, but there had been a pinhole in it. And a wa it was filled with water. So we figured it would probably miss fire. And we had enough food for one good meal for each of us. And we 
were on the border of a huge swamp. We went to bed that night very concerned. <laughs> we began to walk the next day, and we entered water that was up to our knees almost all the time. The, it was in breakup, and the swamp was, was up to the, up knee high with water, and the creeks were running through it at full speed. So we would walk, and when we kept to a creek, we would pull a log and pull and push a log and then scramble across. We fired, but often usually it misfired. The days became turned. We would end up with five days in this swamp. We managed to kill two small birds. And we ate the birds. First we ate the meat, and then we ate the eyes, and then the brains. And then we sucked the marrow from the bones, and then we had the spinal column. <laughs> when we got to willows, we would gorge on the willow tips. We ate last year's blueberries, and we swatted mosquitoes, and we ate the mosquitoes. <laughs> we watched our bodies cannibalize themselves. Our ribs stuck out. Our buttocks became so thin that it hurt to sit down. Every day we would tell ourselves, to, today we're going to get out. And at night, tomorrow we'll be out. We became very weak. It, we could barely walk 100 steps before we had to stop. And then with some, some of the greatest effort, we would get up and continue to walk. But somewhere in there, we knew that we, had, we still had a choice to make. We could either choose to live or give up. And we chose to live. We thought about our family and friends. They waited for our return, and we would get back to them. And we thought of the life ahead that we still had to claim, and we wanted to claim it. So we continued on. In five days after entering the swamp, two weeks after becoming lost, a month after leaving no attack, we pushed through a wall of willows and stood on the bank of the Kobuk River. Our rescuers were a family coming down river. There was about 10 of them in a skiff, and they were overloaded. But when they saw us, they made room for us. And when they saw the condition we were in, they stopped at a, at a sandbar and made us soup and coffee. People, and then after that, we took us to the village of Kayana, about three, three hours down river. People have often asked me, how is it that you made it out when so many people in a similar circumstance have simply given up and died? And I think the answer comes from a Friedrich Nietzsche's quote. He who has a why to live can bear with any how. We decided early on that our why was to make it out, to be reunited with our family and friends, and to claim the life that lay ahead. Rudy and I were, were unable to return to the Brooks Range that year, but we've have since, both of us have since done long distance solo trips in the Brooks Range and, in, and in, around Alaska. But this time, we've been much better prepared <laughs> for the power of Alaska. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Oh my goodness. I think we all learn to take one of those trackers with us if we go hiking anywhere where there's no trails. We're so glad that you made it to be with us here tonight. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome up our fourth and final speaker, Deborah Faith Rose. Now, what do we know about our next speaker? Well, we know that her name is Deborah Faith Rose, and that she teaches a class once a month here at the Senior Center on how to use self-hypnosis for good health. She can look at anyone's handwriting and immediately know a lot about them. We're not letting her near the tickets with your names on them, just so you know. This is because she's a certified handwriting analyst. 
Deborah also is here at the Senior Center every Thursday night with the Great Land Toastmasters. However, we don't know where she's from. Deborah just showed up one day and never seems to leave. She has this funny kind of accent, and soon we will find out the story behind that. So I'd like to invite Deborah up to tell us where exactly are you from? Well, thank you for asking, Mallory. <laughs> for some reason, ever since I've been here, people keep asking me that question. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, they just look at me, shake their head, and ask, where are you from? I say, Texas. Even though I am from Texas tonight, I get to sit right up front at this front table with all these longtime Alaskans. How lucky am I? And now that I've heard their story, I do believe I'm sitting at the wrong table because these folks have earned the right to be here. They are the true pioneers. <laughs> but me, well, <laughs> I just arrived a few years ago, and I'm still trying to figure out why people still keep asking me, where are you from? <laughs> I do have some stories to share with you. No, <laughs> I guess I should say I have some confessions to share. <laughs> and when I do, without a doubt, every one of you, <laughs> You're just going to want to look at me, shake your head, and ask, well, I can see it on your faces right now. You already want to ask, don't you? <laughs> you might as well go ahead and everybody just shake their head and just go ahead and ask me, where are you from? I know everybody else wants to. I know some over here, I see your faces. I know you want to ask me. Just shake your head. Go ahead and do it now. Where are you from? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Thank you. Well, she had all started. November 6, 2011, when that plane left Dallas, Texas in a bright sunny day of 72 degrees, nine hours later landed here in Anchorage, Alaska, a cloudy windy day of 13 degrees that took my breath away. <laughs> I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> You're thinking, well, if 13 degrees takes her breath away, I know she's sitting at the wrong table. <laughs> but you know, I was mesmerized by the snow, the beautiful snow that kept falling and falling and falling, day after day, week after week, until finally, even a long time Alaska said to me, okay, this is enough. It's time for this snow to stop. And I said, I love it. Bring it on. Just bring it on. The more, the better. They just looked at me, shook their head. You got it. And asked, where, where are you from? Now, if you have lived here most of your life, you're probably wondering, why is she so mesmerized by snow? Well, come on, take a little trip with me to Texas. Picture this. As a kid growing up in Texas, I used to hope and pray and pray and hope for just one day a year of snow more than two inches. <laughs> because if it snowed more than two inches, school was out and most of the city was shut down. <laughs> so, woohoo, I was out of school building a snowman. Now, with two inches of snow in the ground, that poor, pitiful little snowman was made of mostly dirt, dead grass, and a little bit of snow. <laughs> that was my big snow day. <laughs> now, come on back with me to November 2011, and here I am in Anchorage, Alaska. Two feet of snow on the ground, not two inches, two feet. So I ask someone, well, is school out until all the snow melts? <laughs> they just looked at me, shook their head, and said, Where, where, where <laughs> are you from? <laughs> Little did I know that was only the beginning. 
You see, that was the year that we had the record-breaking snow that had not been matched since 1955. Before long, there was more than 11 feet of snowfall. I began to realize this snow is not going anywhere anytime soon. I had to learn how to drive on more than two inches. <laughs> not only that, I had to learn where to drive. Well, where's the grocery store? Where's the post office? Where's the sun? <laughs> As I drove around, though, people were quite nice. They were willing to give me directions when I asked. In fact, the first directions I received, they told me, well, go down to the intersection and then go toward the mountains. Well, okay, that sounded easy enough. I mean, who can miss something as large as mountains, right? <laughs> So as I approached the intersection, there they were right in front of me, mountains. Okay, good, I'll go straight ahead. I'm sitting at the red light. Something caught my attention from the corner of my eye, something large looming to my right. Uh-oh, there's some mountains to the right. There's some mountains straight ahead. Do I go straight, do I go right? Which way do I go? Which mountains? <laughs> From then on, every time somebody tells me to go toward the mountains, I say, which mountains? <laughs> they just look at me, shake their head, and ask, where are you from? Mm, Texas? <laughs> oh, I still have so much to learn. <laughs> just the other day. A fellow walked into my office. We made our introductions, and I asked him, what part of Alaska are you from? He said, Unalaska. <laughs> I said, well, that's okay if you're not from Alaska. I'm from someplace else too. <laughs> Where are you from? On Alaska. Now, I thought he was a little embarrassed because he's not from here. So I asked him a third time, where are you from? Ma'am, I'm in Alaska, from Unalaska, therefore I am Alaskan because Unalaska is a town in Alaska. Therefore, Unalaskans are Alaskans living in Unalaska, which is in Alaska. Got it? Now who's embarrassed? <laughs> he just looked at me, shook his head, and asked, Where are you from? At this point, I was beginning to get the idea that I may be giving Texas a bad name. <laughs> oh, and you haven't heard the worst of it. People kept calling me Chichaco. Well, I didn't know what Chichaco meant. Where I'm from, we do have words that are mixed together a bit, like Spanish words and Texas words. We call it Tex-Mex. There's a word, it's pronounced Chuchoca. Oh, I thought, oh, that's what it is. It's just Chuch uh, Chuchoca, Chichaco. Uh, it must be the same thing. They sound a lot alike. I guess that I thought Chichaco was the same as Chuchoca, just pronounced in your Alaskan sort of accent. <laughs> but it was puzzling to me. Why were they calling me that? Maybe my skin's a little getting a little dry. Maybe I, you know, I look a little yellow because Chuchoca means dried cornflour. <laughs> Why are they calling me dried cornflour? <laughs> Well, I went out and I bought new moisturizer. I bought all colors of different shades of makeup. And they still called me dried cornflour. <laughs> it wasn't until just tonight when I heard John's story, I figured it out. <laughs> Chichaco means inexperienced newcomer. Excuse me for a moment, I need to talk to John. <laughs> John, 
you have no idea how much money you have saved me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now I know what Chichaco means. <laughs> Uh-oh, I see that look on your faces. And now all of you want to ask me that question, right? Go ahead, shake your head. Go ahead, ask me. Well, I'm from Texas, but there's more. <laughs> the first time I heard somebody talking about ice frost, I thought it was some new kind of frosty cocktail drink. <laughs> How would a Texan know that it was some mysterious weather condition? The only ice I ever saw was from an ice maker. <laughs> and then one day, I overheard a group of people talking about the weather. They were talking about how it was going to continue to snow and snow for a few days. And there was one fellow, he was not happy about it. I could tell. He spoke up and said, well, all this snow is going to create a lot of... Now, I'm going to quote him, okay? He said, all this snow is going to create a lot of hoar frost. Well, that did it. I walked right over to that man and said, sir, sometimes I know... We are not happy about the weather, but that is no reason to call Mother Nature up. <laughs> well, you know what you just said. <laughs> he just looked at me, <laughs> shook his head, and said, <laughs> You know, this coming November, I'll be here for seven years, and during that time, I have learned a few things. I have learned that hoarfrost is not calling Mother Nature a bad name. I have learned that ice frost is not a frosty new cocktail drink. I have learned that chichaco is not dried corn flour. <laughs> and I have definitely learned that when a fellow tells me he is from Unalaska, that means that he is in Alaska, that he's from Alaska, because Unalaska is a town in Alaska. Therefore, Unalaskans are Alaskans living in Alaska, which is in Alaska. I think I got it. <laughs> <laughs> now, however, this whole going toward the mountain thing, I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> I have learned that Alaskans do quite well in keeping the city running efficiently when there's more than two inches of snow on the ground. <laughs> My fellow Alaskans, from now on, when someone looks at me and they shakes their head and asks, Where are you from? I am going to say, I am from Alaska. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deborah. That was wonderful. I remember coming to Alaska and having my own where are you from moment when people told me that breakup was coming. And I'm standing there going, well, my husband can't break up with me, right? This is like this big breakup. It took me two winters to figure that out. Now, I can blame my blonde hair or just the people who didn't explain it to me and let me live in this kind of perpetual state of who's breaking up with who and why. So I'd like to invite Judy up to do some more door prizes. All right, she's going to grab a runner. Grab a couple of door prizes. I'll let them. I'll let them pick out what's next. They're willing to run out there in the audience and find you. Okay, Delian has picked uh, Alaskan kitchen towel with Alaska moose note cards. Three five one. Three five one. Where are you? Right here, Joyce. All right, the next is uh, another type of Alaskan towel, the kind you hang on your counter uh, drawer knob or your refrigerator or something to have handy. And some note cards. 336. 336, where are you? 
All right, Colleen. Okay, turn it around. No, turn it, turn it that way. <laughs> this is uh, made in our craft room, and it's a bag that you hang, and there's uh, strings in that to hang it with, and you put your uh, shopping plastic bags in, and when you need one, you just pull one out, and you use it. So that goes to 373. It's 373 right here in front. Oh, another lucky wishbone coupons. 325, 325, right there for that gentleman. And we have some Alaskan playing cards and a magnet. Uh, 364, 364. Oh, sorry, we couldn't see you for this arrangement there. We have another dish towel and, and cards. It goes to 429. Way. Way. Dave Barnett. Okay, another cards and a magnet. 312. Hey, what do you what do you have, Nathaniel? You gotta have something to give these people. Come on. <laughs> All right, whatever he brings, get, uh, number 344 gets it. Oh, it's a pewter crab necklace, only in Alaska. <laughs> 344, there's our king regent, Dwayne Heverling. We have a pewter, let me look at it. A pewter otter with a moose magnet and Alaska magnet, and that goes to 355. <laughs> All right, another one similar. The, this one has a keychain with it. 404, 404. Wow, this side's getting warm over here. What about you guys back there, huh? <laughs> Uh, we have two coupons from Arctic Roadrunner, 419. 419. Still this side. You know, they were warm last Saturday. I don't understand this. <laughs> All right. We have a spoon holder, a handmade spoon holder with a dish rag, hand, uh, crocheted dish rag, and soap. And that goes to 399. 399. It's a puffin spoon holder. We have a book, Stories from the 64th, 64 Alaska Earthquake. That goes to 403. Oh, this side's still winning. Come on. I'm mixing them up. I really am. <laughs> All right, we have another book. It's In the Light of the Night and the dark of the day. Only in Alaska can you have it dark during the day, but we do sometimes. Uh, 375. All right, the middle of the room, getting warmer. We have a book donated by the Pioneers of Alaska. It's a compilation of Alaska stories by Anchorage pioneers, fond memories. 365. 365, way back there, good. That the size is getting caught up. Okay, next we have a uh, traveling hair dryer with a bag to put it in. 353. 353. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You got to have hair to use a hair dryer. Well, I think he has more hair in his beard than he does on his head. <laughs> All right. Thanks to Betty Arnett, she donated one of her books uh, that she told us all about. And 374 gets that. Where's 374? Oh, back in the back. And we have a flat iron and a traveling bag to go with it. 383. A 
and I don't understand these things. Delyn, can you tell us what that is? Um, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so you can hook it up to your phone, and it's called the Amazon Alexa, and you can like ask it to do things for you, and it answers your questions. <laughs> <laughs> it takes someone this age to come hook it up for you, too. <laughs> because uh, I, someone last week told me they got one, but they couldn't figure out how to hook it up. <laughs> so the winner of the Alexis is 401. Yahoo! Donna, would you step out a minute? Donna, our head organizer of uh, the servers, made this beautiful uh, afghan for us. Thank you, Donna. And this goes to? Uh, isn't that the bill? Oh, no, 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 no. 393. 393. That's something to keep you warm, sir. Okay, that's it. Okay, that's it, except for we were collecting your dinner tickets. Yeah, did we miss anybody? Uh, runner, could you go get that ladies? Nathaniel, thank you. And these have names on them and uh, email addresses and telephone numbers and I'm gonna put them in the same basket, mix them all up. Wait, we gotta get that, oh, two of them. Get those in. If I get a blank one, they don't win, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, the winner of this beautiful quilt made in our craft shop right here at the Senior Center goes to Nikki Rowe. Is that, am I saying your name correctly? Congratulations. Okay, uh, did you have any closing words for us, Mallory? Before she does, let's give another round of applause to our musicians. As Mallory told you before, we have a tip chart to thank them. They come here, they came from Wasilla? Wasilla, and almost didn't make it, the roads were so bad. But they've been coming and doing this, volunteering here, I think for about seven or eight years. Very kind. As Mallory said, they started out about this, this height, and of course they're taller than I am now. But let's give them another round of applause. And the night wouldn't have been the night without our four speakers. So appreciated you coming. Thank you. So true. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. So we also have the winners of our silent auction. So the winner of the Dance in the Sun by Barbara Lavalley is Amy Hawkinson, but she is not here. She just left, but we can clap for her anyway. So we will make sure that she gets that. She does a great job since she's not here. I can embarrass her by saying what a great job she does by managing the Ferrandi royalty. She is just fabulous and keeps people happy and fed and moving constantly for two weeks. So thank you to her for doing all of that. Now the winner of the Anchorage Winter by Birdsall is Kohis Morisau. Did I say that right? Morris Alvey. Oh, yay! Wonderful! So thank you so much for, for supporting the Anchorage Senior Center. And then the Heart of Alaska was won by Brian Silva. Is he still? Oh! A hairdryer and a print all in one night. Thank you so much for supporting the Anchorage Senior Center. We've got Jin, our accounting coordinator out here, who will be able to help you with that as you leave. I would also I'd like to take a moment to thank Judy Weimer. A huge thanks goes to her. Without her, none of us would be here tonight sharing this amazing experience. And we've got a little something here for Judy. So 
flowers are the least we can do for this incredible woman. Thank you so much, Judy, for all that you do for us. And thank you to our volunteers and our staff. If you're in the room, feel free to wave. This was a lot of incredible work, and you're wonderful, and we appreciate and love you so very much. Thank you to our musicians. And Oh, good. Don is bringing the thirst. So you can pe take a peek in the back. These are all of the wonderful people that made it possible. And thank you, Donna, for leading this wonderful group of volunteers and stepping up. We appreciate you so much. So thank you all for being here. Please join us again next year. We just so appreciate every one of you. Thank you.